In this video, we are taking a look at materials in Blender 2.9. It's beginner friendly, but I recommend that you have some basic knowledge of the software before we start. We will be learning how to add materials to objects, how to change them and build your own, how to import videos and still images, how to set up a PPR material, how to append materials from other files, and we will even go into a bit of animation. But without any further delays, let's just dive right into the process. This is what the file should look like. If not, you have a download link in the description to get this file. This is Kunsthal Orhus, an exhibition space that I really like, and they were kind enough to share with me their technical drawings so we could use them to build up this model that you will find in the past few videos. But now we're going to be taking a look at materials, right? Okay. The first thing we're going to do is to add a material to an object. The first step is to go into the material preview, only so we can see our changes. Then we're going to select an object and I'm going to start with the pillars. So I'm going to left click on the pillars and I'm going to go into the material preview and I'm going to click on new. What happens then is that there's a new material that is created, it gets this generic name, and I'm going to immediately change that to something more just recognizable. And I'm going to call this walls. I do that because I'm going to use this material on all of the walls, the stairs, the pillars, the curved wall, you know, to have one material on all of them. So when I change it, it sort of changes universally, if you like. All right, so when you do that, all of these different properties appear and if not by any chance they do not appear you just have to click on that use nodes button so if, the, if that button is gray you should just enable that and then you should get these sort of uh, properties right base color is the most obvious one to change so i'm just going to pull down the slider to, to make it a bit more a bit more gray and then you have some more properties here the sort of the celebrities of it is the metallic so you can see sort of drastic changes and then there's the roughness. So you can just play around with those to see exactly what they do. I'm gonna keep mine at the 0.5 and the metallic at zero because I want this to be a non-metallic object. All right, so I'm not gonna make any more changes in this. I'm just gonna add this to more objects. So I'm gonna select the walls next, left click on them. And in the material preview, now we can see, no, sorry, in the material properties, now there's no material here because we haven't added any materials to our object, right? So we could as well create a new material here, but we want to use the same we already made. So we will find that in the drop down menu and just choose walls. Do the same with the stairs and the curve to wall. So now when you have any one of those selected, you will find the properties for that material in the material properties. And you can see that it's being indicated that this material has four users. The stairs, the curved wall, the walls, and the pillars. So how about adding more than one material to a single object? That's really simple. You simply select an object, like the walls. You go into edit mode, where you have access to the geometry of the object. And then you can select parts of the geometry and assign that to another material. So you do that by simply creating a new material slot of that object. So in the material properties, you just create a new slot by pressing that plus icon. And in that slot, we will create a new material because we have only one material already. If you have more materials, you can select one from the drop down menu here. I'm going to create a new one and just make that a bit sort of a greenish color. Feel free to do whatever you like there. And then you just, with that object uh, or that part of the geometry selected, you just assign that to this material. So make sure the material is selected in the list here, the correct geometry is selected, and then just press assign. Going back to object mode by pressing tab, you see that now our object has been sort of changed to a multi-material object. So of course you can just continue doing this by simply to selecting the geometry, adding more slots, creating a new material that has some other color, and then just assign different parts of the, uh, whoops, so like remember to select the material, and then just assign different parts of it to different materials. This is the object that we're gonna be creating now and the material. 
I'm gonna show you how to build up this uh, node tree. But before we continue, let's just make sure that we are using Eevee. You will find this in the render properties because Blender has two sort of main render engines, Cycles and Eevee. And there is a there is a significant difference in how they look in rendered view. So just uh, make sure that you're using Eevee for now so you have the same results as me. And I have ambient inclusion, bloom and screen space reflections all enabled. With that out of the way, let's just make the object that we are going to put the material on. So I'm leaving the camera view just... Now we're going to add the cube in. If you don't have the 3D cursor in your scene like I have, that's the little icon down on, on the floor here, you can just hold down shift and right click anywhere in front of you and you can see that that sort of places the 3D cursor where you click because the cube that we create gets created where the 3D cursor is located. Let's just press Shift and A, get the Add menu, Mass and Cube. All right. I am gonna pull that up by just pressing G on the keyboard and then Set, and then just pull it up with the mouse. I just want to like to this. I'm pressing N on the keyboard to open the sidebar. I'm gonna change these dimension values. There's so many ways of changing the size of this cube or like the shape of it, but I'm just going to do this one. So I'm going to change the set value to three meters. I'm going to change the Y value to 16 meters and the X value to 0 0.5. And now I want to apply that scale. I want to tell Blender that this is the actual shape that I want that want it to be. Press control A and apply the scale. And now you can see that the scale values have jumped to one and that's what we want. And I'm gonna rename that in the outliner, just double clicking on it, gradient wall. You can place it of course wherever you want. I'm gonna just sort of like really freely just pull it back to that end wall there. Just so uh, like it's uh, sitting on the ground. Of course you could use some snapping here and stuff, but I think this is fine. Now let's create our material. We're not going to go into the material properties like last time. We're going to go into our shading workspace, which is up here in the top. Click on that and you will see these uh, sort of windows, these areas rearranging. And now we have a file browser, we have an image editor, we have the shading editor or shader editor and the 3D viewport. With our wall selected, now we can press new in the shader editor, which does the same thing as the new button in the material properties so if i click on new here you can see that it also automatically happens in the material properties and when you press new you will get this uh, these notes and notice that you can just zoom in and out using the scroll wheel and holding down the middle mouse button is panning this isn't a 3d environment so you can't orbit in this environment you simply just left click to select things and drag to move them around it's really intuitive and these connectors are the same. You can just sort of just click on these uh, connectors and just drag them into different inputs and outputs. All right, so we have now our principled shader. That's this one here. And we have already been doing changes to that in the material properties. But now we have the same values here, but just as a node, All right? But I'm gonna add in more nodes to create our gradient material. And we do that by either going into the Add menu here or pressing Shift A. And in the Texture group, you will find a gradient texture. I'm just gonna drop that in there, but if we need to have another one in between, which is a color wrap. So I'm gonna do Shift A again. And in the Converter menu, you will find a color wrap. But to be fair, I never use these sort of groups. I always just go into the search where I just type in color wrap and then you just find that note. So when you memorize the names of them, you can really quickly sort of add them in. So that's just shift A, click on the search and then type in, you know, something that makes you find that note. So now you have these three notes here and you can connect them by just simply taking the the factor of the gradient node into the factor of the color ramp and the color from the color ramp into the base color. Nothing is changing on in our in our uh, 3D viewport. I'll 
show you why in two seconds because we will have to add to the gradient node two more nodes which are texture coordinate node and a mapping node and that is so that blender knows how to put the material onto the object right now it is on the object the gradient we just can't see it because it's sort of coming from the back sort of this way like so we need to tell blender that it should be sideways so a quick way to do that is to enable an add-on which is insanely important when it comes to the shader editor and working with nodes so it's inbuilt so we don't have to install anything we just have to go to edit and preferences and in the add-ons so the add-ons uh, menu tab you just simply search for wrangler Oop. there you go node wrangler so enable that save preferences and close this again so now what you can do is that you can select this node here the gradient the gradient the uh, texture and just press ctrl t ctrl t and then it sets up for you a texture co coordinate sort of uh, buddies so we want to rotate this on the set axis which is from the top minus 90 okay now we have made that sort of uh, gradient appearing our, on our object but it is only black and white so that's where the color ramp can help us add colors into it so these sort of flags you can see that the selected one has a white top and the color for that flag is down here in this field so you can just start playing with these uh, sort of colors and you can add more in by pressing the plus so if i add in let's say two more and they're not really equal so to equalize them out you can use this drop down menu with the arrow and you can say distribute stops from left Oop. distribute stops evenly now you have them even evenly sort of spread out four of them but the colors are way off so we are just gonna go to the first one and i'm gonna use i'm just gonna put in this hsv uh, values which is the uh, hue and saturation Right, I'm gonna just have the hue in zero and the saturation is 0 0.9 and there's a value here in 0 0.6 these are some colors that I have already made before and I'm gonna just copy copy those onto the uh, onto the other ones and this is actually a really nice trick that I didn't really know about Blender until really late is that when you're copying colors you can simply just hover over the color and press Control C and then when you select the next flag and you hover over the color and you just press ctrl v and it just copy pastes that so you don't have to click into the field to paste the value you just have to hover over the value and then sort of paste values into it it's really amazing so now with those now we have the same material in all of them so i only want to change the hue of them so if i change the hue of this one here the second one into 0.125 and the next one i'm going to change the hue to something like maybe 0.3 you can always change this afterwards and the hue of this one to something like there uh, this one is bugging me something like that okay we got that like this sort of like a color uh, this cold to warm thing but of course you can completely decide what colors you want you can add more in if you like and there is also a nice trick if you have like i have this setup here now you have this uh, i have this gradient image and if i just hold and drag that down into my image editor it appears there you can also drag and drop just from your desktop just right into the uh, image editor and the color ramp now has this uh, eyedropper tool so if you select that and then you hold and drag so you have to create a path so if I take from pink through yellow into blue into dark blue, if I just hold down and just pull this path like that, you can see that it will create that path in your color up. And then you can go and distribute evenly. So you have them all sort of set up like this. So that's how you can steal colors from images. But I'm gonna use the one we had before, and not this one. So the next step would be to 
make this glow. Right now, the color from the color ramp is being fed into our base color. I'm just gonna pull this edge up a bit so we can zoom a bit more into this. You can also feed the color ramp color information into the emission of the principled shader. But you can take the color and put that into the emission. You can see the changes. So if you take the emission strength down to zero, this is how it did look before, and now one, and it just sort of like pops, right? Of course, if you take the strength higher up, you will see that it just sort of like starts to burn out the colors. So it's not necessarily so nice. So maybe three or two, something like that. Now you can also take the metallic up, or let's say the roughness all the way down. And if you take the metallic all the way up as well, it becomes even more reflective. Okay, now it's reflective. So now it's like a screen or something, right? And that's the look I'm looking for. Uh, and now for the next step, we need to add in some details on top of this, like these black lines. So we do that by simply pulling this one a bit to the side. I'm gonna copy the color up. So just select it, shift D, and pull that up like that. I'm also gonna copy the mapping node, shift D, and put that up here. Texture coordinate can go into the vector of the top one as well. And the vector of that goes into the color ramp. However, I'm gonna make this back into a black and white one. So I'm gonna go back into this drop-down menu and reset color ramp. And instead of a gradient texture, here I'm gonna add in a different texture. So Shift A, Texture, and Wave Texture. And you can see that when you move this around, there are like some, some of those uh, sort of sort of lines, they get highlighted, and that means that if you drop them there, it will be connected in that path. So now our Wave Texture is now sort of connected between the mapping node and the color up. And to see what we are doing, simply just connect this color into the color of the principled. Yeah, it's a bit hard to see, but it's there. You can see these stripes in uh, in our in our, on our wall. They will get more sharp if you play around with these flags in the uh, in that black and white color ramp. You can see that now they are a bit more evidently there. I'm going to start by changing the bands from bands to rings, and I'm going to change the change it to saw as well change the scale to something like 20, leave the rest how it is. But I wanna change now the rotation. So I wanna change it from, I'm gonna just take this down to zero and the Y value to minus 90. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna take these two and I wanna mix them together. So I wanna mix them and feed that mixture into the both the emission and the color, right? To mix them together, you can hold down Control and Shift, and then right-click and drag between them, and let go, and that creates a mix RGB node. Alternatively, you can press Shift A and search, type in Mix, and you will find Mix RGB there and you can drop that in and connect it manually if you like. But the Note Wrangler add-on lets you hold down Control and Shift and right-click drag between nodes that you want to connect this way. It's a really nice shortcut. So, and the color from that also goes to the emission. The Mix RGB node has these different ways of mixing. And if you're familiar with Photoshop, you also probably know some of these uh, sort of mix types. And if I use, for example, Darken, and increase the factor to one, then you can see that the color of the one below, the color of this one is coming through, but the, the black or the dark areas of the top one is uh, being overlaid. And now of course you can play with these values in the top one, if you wanna create like a more of a gradient looking overlay. You can also change all the values in the wave texture. So the scale or the uh, from, from saw to sine, that becomes a bit more smooth on both sides. The, uh, the saw one is sort of like one-sided gradient. And a nice way to get rid of the soft gradient and get just really hard, sharp lines is to go from linear to 
to constant. And you have to drag this white value back to one side, and then you get this really graphic, like super hard edges, right? And of course you can play around with this. If you want to have some different type of an effect, just you can go through those. And a quick way to do that is to hover, hover over this value, hold down control, and then scroll down with the scroll wheel. And then you just go between options. And you don't have to always open up this menu and choose the next one. The next step would be to animate this material. And to do that, let's just go into the animation work area or workspace. And now we don't really see anything that we want to see. But if you just hover over one of the windows and you press zero, you will go into camera view. And let's change that camera view to the material preview. Also, if these sort of icons, if they're not appearing in your window, you can scroll back and forward and that sort of like moves that menu left and right in case if your window is too small. So I'm gonna go into the material preview then we can see our wall there. And I'm going to change this area into the uh, shader editor by just going up to the editor type menu and finding the shader editor in that. This massive sidebar here, I'm just going to collapse that by pressing N. And this is not the correct material, so I'm just going to left click on my wall. And here we go. Yes. So the values that we are going to be animating, we will find them in these two nodes, mapping and wave. So it's in the top, basically it's the black lines here. So you can pretty much animate any value like this in Blender, like if it has to do with just anything really. You can just put in keyframes into, into boxes like this, and I'm going to show you really quickly how. So the timeline gives you frame 1 to 250, also represented down here, 1 to 250. If you want to increase the length of your timeline, simply just type in another value into the end there and you will get that. 250 is fine, but make sure you are on frame 1. And then we're going to just select one of the values, like let's say this sort of rotation, if I want to, I want to make the motion do something like this. Right, okay. You can completely choose what you do, but I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna start with something like that. This is gonna be my first frame. So I'm just changing the rotation Y value. Now it's approximately minus 88. And I'm on frame one, I got the correct value. So I simply just hover over the value and I press I on the keyboard as an in insert or input. You can see that our timeline, or this is actually not a timeline, this is actually the dope sheet. You don't have to think about the difference between the two at this moment, but let's just uh, continue. So we have insert a keyframe on the uh, on the first uh, whoop, on the first frame, and now we want to move to the last frame. You can also type in a value here, 250, or alternatively, you can also use shift and left and right arrows to jump between first and last frame. That's shift and right to go to the last frame. So we want to change this value to something like this. And now I want to press I again. And what happens now if I start pl press play, you can see that it simply just makes that movement between the two keyframes. And if you don't like this interpolation or the fact that it sort of sl starts up slowly and then gains speed and then slows down again, if you want it to be more constant, you can simply just hover over your timeline press T for interpolation and then instead of Bashir, which is the default sort of uh, mode, you can go to linear. And what that does is simply just creates a constant speed for your animation. Okay, we can just keep this playing for now. <laughs> I'm going to go back to my layout workspace, which is this one here. And I'm taking a look on the edges, because the edges are a bit fucked up because we did the texture coordinate thinking about the front, but not the sides. So I'm also gonna rename this gradient. There we go. Rename the material, and I'm gonna add in another material. And to be fair, that can just be maybe the wall. 
let's see if the wall thing will look good on that. I'm gonna select. Notice that I'm using the face select mode in edit mode. So I'm gonna just select, shift select the edges, something like this. And select the walls material and assign that. And while I'm doing this, I actually want to assign that back, uh, like these two. I want them back, back to like being the gray walls. So you can either assign them back to walls or you can also just delete those two materials. I just, oh, it tells you that you cannot remove material slots while in edit mode. So exit edit mode, go back to object mode, and then delete those two material slots. I'm gonna hide the sidebar for anything there, go back to camera view, and take a look at our scene. To see this even better, you can just disable these uh, overlays, and you can see our little animation real time. For this next part, we are going to learn how to set up a PPR material. PPR is a physically based render, and it's a type of a material setup that achieves or can achieve a high level of realism. So we are going to put a wooden floor on our floor. The first step is just to enable the overlays so we know what we are selecting. I'm going to go back to my shading workspace and with the floor selected, create a new material. Now we have the principled shader here. And by the way, if you're having issues with uh, seeing this workspace here, you make sure that you are in object rather than world in this drop down menu here. So we uh, have our principled uh, BSDF shader here, and we're going to be connecting all the different PPR maps into that one. Follow the link in the description to download the wooden floor that I'm using if you like, otherwise you can use any other PPR material that you find online. There's a number of great sources and I will maybe link to some of them in the description as well. But if you have the same wooden floor as me, then you can just follow these steps. So you basically drag and drop the files just into the shader editor. I'm going to start with, the, with this one here, which is basically just giving us the color. So I'm going to just drag that in here. Second one is, I'm gonna drag the gloss one, this gray one, have that below. Then I'm gonna take the bump map, and lastly, the normal map. So I'm gonna full screen my shader editor now, which is control spacebar, and connect them. So. The top one, which was the color, just goes into the color of the principal shader, color to color. Second one, which is the gloss one, which is determining the where it should be glossy and where it should be matte. That should be a non-color, so make sure it's a non-color uh, color space. From the drop drop down menu, the same as the other two. That should be non-color, both of them. Okay, so the. Uh, the gloss goes into the roughness, so just color to roughness. The bump and the normal map, they will be connected through a bump node. So you go shift A and then search, type in bump, enter, drop that in there. And then you connect the color of the bump into the height, the color of the normal map into the normal, and then normal to normal, like that. Then you're going to select one of them, doesn't matter which one, and press Ctrl and T. That gives you the uh, mapping and texture coordinate node. You have to have the uh, uh, the node wrangler add-on enabled. You will see that in uh, earlier in this video how we did that. And I am gonna connect these all into the same coordinates. And there's a fine. So now this is set up. So if you go back to our other scene by just pressing control spacebar again, you can see that the wooden floor is already there. Of course it's way too big, so in the mapping node we can change the scale from 1 to let's say 3. I changed all three by just simply left clicking and dragging over these three fields, and then you can type in one value that sort of gets filled into all of those uh, fields. Yeah, right? Alright, 
Uh, I want to rotate mine as well, so I'm going to type in 90 degrees in the on the set rotation. And I'm pretty happy with this. Okay, let's just take a look a bit what each map does. So for that, I'm going to isolate the floor from everything else by taking it into what's called local view. If you don't have this as a shortcut, you will find it in view, local view, and then toggle local view. My shortcut is numpad forward slash. And I'm going to take the uh, value of the environment line, light down to zero and change to rendered view. So now there's uh, no light in my scene, but I'm going to create a light source. So shift A and light and point. You don't have to follow this necessarily. Um, this is more just to show or illustrate like what these maps do. And you can immediately see like what's happening here, right? So now you can see that this uh, these maps are creating these illusions of shadows like all these different sort of cracks and nuances in the surface so if i disable them one by one so if i just for example take the roughness and the bump and the normal map out and only the color is there you can see that it just looks like a laminated you know like a picture of wooden floor it doesn't give you the sense that there's actually wooden floor there and then if i add in the roughness it's a bit more now like the uh, the middle parts are really shiny which is to be fair probably wrong but okay so now you can see that the uh, that it should probably be the other way around let's just fix that right now so i'm going to add in an inward note and to be fair, that is also really common when it comes to these things, is that you might have to add an inward node between the gloss and the roughness, because sometimes the gloss maps are like the other way around. Like there's no uniform idea of them in the industry. Some of them, meaning because it's a black and white, white image, some of them make them so the black things should be shiny, and some of them make it so that the, the, the black things are rough. So you might need an inward node just to sort of like correct that. But okay, and then we add in the bump and the normal. And a lot of stuff happened, right? So, maybe I just take it, just the, just the bump first. So the bump is basically just the lines in between here. So if I just take the strength down to zero, this is how it looks without the bump. This is with the bump. So it just creates those slight sort of uh, shadows and light behavior in between there. And then the normal map is creating all these imperfections in the wood itself. All of these different scratches and, you know, so you can see that if I take the normal out, everything is just really flat in between. These are tiny, tiny details that just make the overall image look more realistic. Something that you may not necessarily notice, in the, you know, the first time you see it, but you might notice it if it's not there, right? Okay, I'm just going to delete this light take my strength of the environment back to one select my floor and then toggle the local view again view local view toggle logo view if you don't have the shortcut assigned to this now we have set up our ppr material a really fast way to do this is to use the node wrangler add-on so make sure that you have that enabled in the properties before you do this. But that is, basically I'm going to copy the principled shader and set up another material so you can see how it works. So you have your principled shader selected and you press Ctrl, Shift and T. And you navigate to where you keep your PPR material. And in my case, it is coupled stone material. And you can simply just select all of them and choose this option here, Principled Texture Setup. And what it does, as you can see, it basically sets everything up for you. It puts the normal map node in between the normal map and the normal input of the Principled shader. It creates the mapping. It's a bit clustered together with the other one. <laughs> so it just sets it up for you. And you can see that it's already on the ground, and now we can just play with the scale, select all those, maybe 10 or something. 
So you can see that you have already set up a nice looking cobblestone floor. But the Denison material doesn't react so nicely to this because this is based on some type of a naming convention, you know. So they have to have something in their name so Blender or this add-on understands where to put everything. But the Denison things, they don't work so well with this. But a lot of the materials do. And so it's this is a really, really nice shortcut. I recommend using it when you can. That's shift Control t but okay, but I'm really happy with my Denison material, even if it doesn't work properly with the add-on, then it doesn't take that much time to uh, do this manually. So in this part, we are going to learn how to import images and videos into our scene. But first, I would like to change the... Uh, the ceiling and those sort of ceiling beams into the same material as the walls. So we know how to do that. I'm just going to select the beams first and just in the material properties choose the walls material and then the ceiling part as well. And there's also a couple of small beams in the end there that is a separate object. Well, now everything seems to be there. Yeah. And I want to take down the color of the walls to a bit brighter gray color. Something like this. Okay. So, the first thing I would like you to do is to enable one simple add-on. And it is in Edit and Preferences. And then it is simply search for Image and make sure that this import-export add-on is enabled. Import images as planes. If it's not, just check this box and then go to this little icon here and save preferences. What that does is that now in the add menu, shift A, you have images as an option here, which you already had before, but there's an extra option there called images as planes. So that's what we're going to do. But I'm gonna I'm gonna move my 3D cursor to the location where I want my images to be. So I'm gonna just do this in material preview up here rather than rendered view. And I'm gonna select my walls, I'm gonna go into edit mode by hitting tab. I'm gonna enable my screencast shortcuts. Yep, here we go. I'm gonna select this end wall. I'm using the face select mode in edit mode of the wall. So with this little piece of wall selected, I'm gonna press shift and S and then move the cursor to selected. That's the bottom option. That means that the cursor, the 3D cursor, will just jump to the middle of this selected object. Now I'll go back to object mode because I was just using the wall as an anchor. And now I am going to press Shift and A and go into Image and Image as Planes. Then you simply just navigate to where you keep your images. So in my case, I'm going to just get, get an image uh, which I made in Blender as well. It's just this one here, Print 1. Just select it, open it, and then I'm just going to zoom in there. And you can see that it's already something on there but it's rotated the wrong way so I'm gonna hit R and set and 90. It's flickering like this because it's sitting exactly in the same location as the wall so it's having hard time to decide which one should be visible the wall or the image. You can fix that by just simply pulling it slightly out of the wall creating a tiny bit of a gap in between but here you go. But let's take a look at the actual setup, the node setup, which is happening there. So I'm going to pull this up. So what this is doing is 
it has a principal shader as a default. It takes the image, the print one image, and it connects the color to co base color, but alpha to alpha, but this image doesn't have an alpha layer. It is just an image. So we might want to go into this option here in the shading and disconnect the alpha. And you can also see it's quite sort of glossy. You can change the roughness of it, of course. If you take all the way up, it will not have any reflections. And if you take it all the way down, it will be more reflective. Uh, if you want this to pop more out and be like more of a, a strong image, you can change, you can, you can plug the color of the image into the emission. And then it will like sort of start to emit the image. And in Eevee, it will sort of start to glow like this. And that is because we have the bloom enabled in the, um, in the render uh, properties. But if you disable that, it will sort of just make the image a bit more clear. But if I switch from Eevee to Cycles, I mean the uh, rendered properties, by the way, and you can see that there is like this nice reflection, almost as if it's made from glass. And if I take the roughness up, that reflection disappears. If I unplug the emission, you will see that it sort of blends in and doesn't really come out that strong. So sometimes it's good to connect the images into emission. And even if I just add in an emission node and plug it into the color of that and the emission to the surface and just skip the whole principal shader. So that's shift A to add to find a new node and search for emission and then you can select the principal node and just press X to delete it. Now you can see that it has been simplified a lot, no reflection, nothing, and now it's more just like a graphic object that doesn't really respond to the environment, and that is due to its uh, simplicity of the shader, that it only has a emission value of a number value, so if you take it up to 5, it will just sort of shine stronger. I'm going to change it back to a principled shader. Do that by just selecting the node and pressing Shift S, then you can switch out nodes. And I'm gonna change it. connect the color to emission and take the roughness down. Yes, I would actually like this to be sort of like a glass plate. Okay. I'm gonna scale this up a bit. I'm gonna go back to Eevee. Okay, the next type of image I want to import is an image with an alpha layer. So I'm going to do the same thing. Shift A, image, image as planes. And I have prepared a same image, but with an alpha layer. Let's see what that does. So I'm going to treat it the same way. R set 90. Move it a bit out. Oops. Move it sideways and scale it up. So now you can see that it doesn't have any any background because uh, I simply just removed the background in Photoshop and just kept it transparent. And this is a PNG, while the other one was a JPEG. You can also see that in the uh, in the note that this is called print underscore one JPEG, and this one is print one alpha png and this one does have an alpha, la alpha layer so when this sets up the uh, the uh, the notes it sort of assumes that it has an alpha layer because this is really much used with you know when you're putting in people or plants or trees or whatever into your scene sort of like an archivist style then this is really helpful because it sets up the alpha layer for you and it does give like a shadow like a nice shadow and there are some set settings in uh, in the uh, material uh, properties so I'm gonna collapse the surface I'm gonna go into settings and here it has the blend mode and shadow mode so it's alpha blend now that's basically what enables it to have this transparency by default EV materials are opaque so if you don't go through this uh, uh, Im images of planes add-on it will not do this automatically so then you will get something like this so you will have to go into the material settings of this material and enable the alpha 
blend mode and the shadow mode should also be alpha clip or hash. I never remember which one it is. But it basically, it's the, uh, wait, let's, uh, oh, there's not really any lights here to, to give me proper shadows. Let's fix that. Okay, now having added light into the scene here, you can see that now the shadow of this object is just simply the whole plate, and that is because it's on opaque. But if you change it to alpha clip, then the shadow will sort of follow the uh, the object and ignore the uh, transparency or the alpha channel. I think alpha hashed does something similar. Not completely sure about the difference there. So you might need to do this manually, like these blend modes. So. Just know that they are there. That's in the material properties, in the settings, only if you're using EV. This happens automatically if you're using cycles. Okay, I'm gonna delete this light or maybe not actually. Maybe it's nice to have a little light source next to these images. We'll keep it there for now and adjust it later. And if you didn't follow me uh, how to add the light in, I just simply just shift A, light and point. So, uh, the next type would be videos. And that is done exactly the same way. Shift A, image, image as planes. And now we just navigate to our, to our video. Minus here, Hyper C, 4K, import that. And I'm gonna move mine immediately, just sort of in there, into that little space. Of course, it's completely up to you where you keep your video, but I kind of like this space because I've I've been there myself many times watching uh, video pieces. This is a really nice room for video pieces, dark and nice. So I think I would like to install this video there. I'm gonna just put it there for now. I'm not gonna fine tune the location of it. Just gonna show you how the node setup appears. So really similarly to the images, it just sets up the alpha channel that we don't need. Of course, if you have a video that has an alpha channel, you should feel free to uh, to uh, to use that channel, but I'm not doing that. So it has uh, some information here that we need to check. So it has the frames, the number of frames, start frame, the offset. This is all fine. And out of refresh, if I press play, Go back to the layout so I can have the timeline here. I'm gonna press play. That's a good idea to maybe navigate to my video. Oh, it is selected, so I'm just gonna press comma. There we go. And now it's playing. As simple as that. And again, you can go into the shading option and then you can play with these uh, with these uh, sort of values of like putting it through the emission rather than just the base color. So then it will sort of more pop. Of course, if I change it to cycles, you will see how that changes everything. So if I pause it, so you can see how the video now is emitting and giving light into the space. And you can change the strength of that in the emission strength. So if I take it up to 10, of course, it will start to like sort of blow out the colors, which we don't really like, but you know, that's there. So maybe two would be appropriate or something like that. But this is how easy it is to add images and videos into Blender and start to use them immediately in your scene. Now let's take a look at how we can import or append materials from other Blend files. I'm using the Holographics shader from Vex and there's a link in the description where you can download this for free. The first thing I want to do is to place the 3D cursor somewhere in the middle of the room, like there. You can do that by simply holding down shift and right clicking to just place it around. It doesn't have to be accurate, just so it is sort of like somewhere in this space. Alright? Then I'm gonna press shift and A in the add menu, go to mess and a plane. I'm just gonna pull that up a tiny bit, so G and set, and just pull it up like this. In the modifier panel, which is this blue rents icon. I'm gonna add a modifier, which is gonna be the ocean modifier. 
that you find up here. It's massive. So we want to scale it down a bit. So inside the modifier, we will have spatial size. So let's just decrease that until it sort of gets back to some type of relevant size for us. So we need to change the waves. So the scale, smallest wave choppiness. All right, so we take the scale down. I'm gonna give it already like some type of a material. So I'm in the material properties and I'm just gonna give it a bit of a darker material so we can just see the uh, more of the details in it go back to the blue runs icon and the resolution is the sort of the big game changer here resolution viewport so you can increase that you'll see that if i take that to like let's see the changes right 20 50 oh that's maybe quite high 50 is really high this gives a lot of nice details in the waves, but I think I'm just gonna stick to something like 15 for now. Okay. And the render should be the same if you want to look the same in the render. So normally you would do the other way around. You would have like the, the view put something like seven and the render 15. So when you actually render this out, it has the resolution of 15, but the viewport is seven. So it's a bit easier for your computer to handle it. But I'm going to have both 15 at this time. So talking about time, that's the next value here. If you if you sort of scroll through it, you can see the movement. So this is a value like we just did with the texture in the background. You can animate this value. So if I take it to 1, and we are now currently on frame 1 in the timeline, and I just press I, hovering over this value, and then I will go to the last frame, shift right and then change this to something else let's say just one oh two it was already one and then press i again and then i press play on the keyboard now you can see that it's already starting to animate our ocean modifier there's also a really nice way to create an actual ocean and if i go back to my material and i will take the roughness all the way down you can see what happens it just sort of creates this beautiful watery movements but now you can also see that the movement is sort of sort of slowly starts and then goes down again. So we also did this earlier. Now you can just op you can pull up your timeline here, hover over it and press T, and then choose linear instead of bezier. And now we should just run sort of smoothly. Now we've got some kind of an animation going on. That's good enough for me. And I am going to give it another modifier. So I'm gonna collapse this and I'm gonna add another modifier which is going to be the solidify. What that does is simply just gives it some thickness as you can see. So I'm just gonna give it a tiny bit of a thickness, maybe less, something like this. So it just isn't like infinitely thin, it just has a tiny bit of a sort of a physicality to it. And now let's get the material. I'm going to pause the animation while I'm doing this. I'm looking at this in rendered view, by the way. You can also look at this in material preview, which is maybe easier for the computer to handle. So to append materials, you are simply, you don't have to have the object selected because you are just appending assets from another file into this file. So you don't have to have anything specific selected. You just go to file, append, and here I have the holographics by Vex, and this is a blend file. So you can also open this independently and take a look what is inside. But we are appending from it, so we're gonna open it up. And now we have the access to the whole tree of this file. So it's cameras, brushes, collections, lights, you know, all kinds of things, objects. Oh, but we are gonna go into material. And here we have two things, and I'm gonna take the holographics by Vex version one, and I'm gonna append that. Nothing happens because it's just now in this file. So now we have to select our object, go to the material properties, go to the drop down menu, and here we will have holographics by wax. It has a zero because it hasn't been assigned to any, uh, any user. 
So we'll just click on that. And here we go. Now, if I go into the shading workspace and look at my object, you can see that I actually have the paid version, so I bought it off of Vex, but the free version should only include this one here, I believe. Not all the other ones. It's a bit of a, a simplified version, I guess. So here we have a shader. This is like a, a shader that uh, that Vex has created for us, and uh, and it has some sort of different uh, properties that I just recommend that you play around with. The frequency sort of changes the scale of it. You have the base colors, you know, so you can change a bit of the colors in it. You know, and you can just play around. But this is the basis of uh, just appending a material and how simple it is to add it to a. Uh, an object. Now if I press play, it's sitting there perfectly. If you like to control a bit more where the materials appear on the object, like let's say not on the bottom or the sides, you can go back into the modifier and the solidify modifier has a material properties panel. Material offset, this is the bottom part, so if, uh, if you put one on that one and the rim to one as well, that means same. If you go into the material here, the material properties of this object, and you create another slot, and you have a material there, and let's just have that, even just the wall material, you see that if you offset the material by one in the material uh, properties, that means that you are telling the modifier, the solidify modifier, to offset its uh, material focus away from the first slot to the next one which will be this one here. And if you want to have a different material on the bottom than on the sides, you can create another one, which would be, let's just say that would be the, uh, the Hypercy video. And then if I go to the Solidify modifier and take the material offset, which is the bottom part, and I put that to two, then that one is looking at the actual ocean, right? Now this thing has a video of the actual ocean on top. That kind of looks weird. I'm curious to see how that looks if it's... Uh... Wow. That's nuts. Oops. So now it's upside down. I'll flip it again. You know, so you have that option within the solidify modifier to choose what material goes on the sides and what goes onto the bottom. But I actually would like this just to be same color not this video there and if it's the uh, and i don't want it to be the walls maybe we'll just choose one of these ones oh what is this one don't even know i'm just gonna create a new one there new material and i'm just gonna call it uh, ocean bottom and just make it black The next step for us would be to take a look at how this looks in both EV and cycles, just to make sure that everything is good. So I'm going to go back out of this full screen mode, control space bar, and I'm going to go into my rendered view. I'm going to go to the camera view as well. Okay. I have almost everything in frame there. So in EV, the light is really even you know like it uh, EV is not as good as handling like realistic light but it's good for a lot of purposes and of course maybe you're not looking for like super realistic lights you know but this is what an EV render could look like just press play so we can actually see how it is flowing okay but if I change this to cycles which we do in the render properties here in the top it will take a lot more computing power to, to handle that. And now we can see where the light is sort of seeping through in a greater detail. You can see the light from the stairs, there's a light from that skylight, and also in the back. That is also how the actual space is in Kunsthal Orhus. So a 
quick explanation of how to render an image is simply by just going to render and render image. But before doing that, make sure to check out in the render options here, the render properties, that your sample count, that is basically the biggest factor when it comes to a render, is this number here. 600 is quite high maybe, but you can start with something like 50 and you can see how fast your computer is rendering and make sure to check the adaptive sampling because that speeds things up for you. But otherwise just uh, uh, maybe start with 50 and then work yourself, work yourself like up to a higher number and you will just find that sweet spot when the image is not too grainy but also doesn't take many hours to render. So make sure that this number is uh, appropriate for you. Go to the output and make sure the dimension is the desired size. So as it is for me now, it is sort of like a 4K resolution, but on 50%, so it just gives me a 2K output. And if you're doing an animation, make sure the output location is something that is not the temporary file uh, folder because it's just hidden away somewhere deep in the computer. So make sure to navigate and create a folder that makes sense for you. And I normally use uh, PNG or JPEGs. So I render out each frame individually and then I compile them in a video editing software back into a video. But if you're rendering an image, you don't need to, you don't need to like set the output location because you, you do it just like this. You go to render, render image. It renders your image for you. And okay, I, I obviously have denoising on because you can see how it is snapped from being grainy to being really smooth, certainly. Uh, I generally don't like denoising, so it was kind of a mistake there. But when the image has been rendered out, you can go into image and then save as, and then you can choose if you want to save it as a JPEG or PNG and the location. So that's how you do still images. But if you are doing a video, you should, or multiple frames, then you should choose a location and a format and then you go to render and render animation and then it will run through every single frame and do the same process and then save each uh, file in that destination that you chose. This is in cycles, right? But if you change to EV, it's relatively sort of the same process. We have samples, but the samples are generally not as important because uh, EV is just a really good sort of like a real-time engine. So it's I think by default puts a 64 and 16, but honestly, I don't see a lot of difference between like 64 and 16. But if I just render this out now, render image, it happens like almost immediately. It's really fast. So if you're doing like a walkthrough or a video, it's, I mean, it's amazing using Eevee because it's just so incredibly fast. But generally the same principles with the video, you have to go to output, choose a location or format, and then just render and render animation thank you for watching i hope this uh, benefits you i hope you learned a lot from this and i hope this enables you to make some amazing artworks